So computer programming has been around pretty much since the 1960s, although it was in its infancy back then. Really started taking off more in the 1970s and 80s, and of course now it's completely out of control. There are probably about a million jobs just in the United States alone that are going unfilled. Uh, it's been a long journey, and initially when computer programming came out, people looked at jobs that programmers had to do, and uh, they basically looked at the, the jobs and they said, you know, it's like, uh, it's like a recipe. You know, it's like you, you do this, then you do this, then you do this. So they looked at computer programs or the tasks that computers were charged with, and they mostly saw them as a collection of action items or verbs. And this led to a paradigm in programming called procedural programming. And basically what that means is that you set, a, set up a set of instructions and you just execute them one after another and you, know, you just tell the computer, okay, first I want you to uh, add two numbers together, then put the number in storage, then add a third number, then multiply it by seven. So it just looked at like a, a sequence of steps and it seemed extremely intuitive and logical that the program should be thought of as a bunch of verbs connected together, a bunch, bunch of action words connected together. And this worked pretty well for a couple of decades. But then something happened, and what happened was that the program started to get much larger. And if we were to look, for example, at the amount of time it takes to create a program and the number of people that were assigned to write the program, right? So let's say that uh, it takes a person, oh, I don't know, maybe it takes them a month to write a program. But then if you have three people working on the program, you can see it takes less time to write the same program. You see that, right? And so basically if a boss was in charge of putting out a piece of software and they needed the code completed by a certain deadline, they would go to their superior and say, well, for this, to get this program written within six months, I'm going to need 10 people. And so based on that, they could try to figure out, based on how much time they were allocated, they could figure out how many people they needed. Now, what ended up happening sometime, I don't know if it was the late 70s, early 80s, when the program started to grow in size, they found a strange phenomenon where basically if you had a very large program to write, um, you basically had this situation where after a while, uh, adding more people to the project actually was a detriment to how long it took to get the project done. Can anyone guess why would it be that I add more people to solve the problem and it actually takes longer? Mr. Baker, they're getting in each other's way. That's exactly what Mr. Baker is trying to say. So basically what's happening here is they're just, you know, you ever heard, uh, uh, they're starting to run into each other. They're starting to like one person thinks that this variable means one thing. Another person means, thinks the variable means another thing. And then they have a disagreement. And one writes the code one way. One writes the code another way. It doesn't quite work out. I think you can see where if you have too many people, it could start to become a problem. Now, this became a real issue because sometimes you need the program written faster and now having more people involved isn't going to solve the problem. You see, see the issue, right? So they needed to come up with a new way of programming that was not procedural anymore. And that led to some folks in California coming up with this idea for what they call an object-oriented model. And the idea behind an object-oriented model is that instead of looking at a program as a series of steps that need to be accomplished, we can instead think of the program as a bunch of objects that interact with one another. So try to think of an object as having some data associated with it and some methods, the things that the object can do. Now the advantage of this approach is that when you have a very large program like this, you can give objects to certain people. I can say, okay, Bridget, you own this object over here. And uh, Mr. Mitty, you own this other object over here. And then you basically write your object and you write your object. And there's much less interaction between the programmers now. Because what happens is when Bridget writes her object, 
she writes a document telling the world all the things that her object can do, and then later on, if Mr. Mitty wants to use Miss Bridget's object, he instantiates one, uses it, and then eventually it goes away. So with this type of an idea, programming kind of migrated from being a selection, a sequence of verbs to being a collection of nouns. And so the idea here was that you wanted to be able to continue on this path and be able to write very large programs by adding more people and still have the amount of time needed to write the program shrink. That was the idea. Now, I happen to have been in the middle of my career as a programmer when this transition took place. So in other words, I was a procedural programmer and one day at work the boss came in and says, we're going to become object oriented. And because I had been programming procedurally for many years, it took like a good two or three years for my brain to unlearn how to do procedural programming and to learn object-oriented programming. This has led some teachers to suggest that maybe it's not such a good idea to teach students in high school and college procedural programming first and then when they get to college have them unlearn it and then learn object-oriented maybe it would be a good idea to teach them object-oriented from the very beginning and that way they don't ever have to unlearn the procedural part. Now I will tell you that if you've taken computer science principles you've already had a little taste of procedural. Most of the teachers who teach AP Computer Science A follow the curriculum that is on that poster in the back of the room with those 10 units listed there. And what happens is that the first four or five of those units are procedural, so they teach students how to do procedural programming. And then later on, they introduce the concept of objects and classes, and then they transition the student from procedural over to object-oriented. But this has led some, some teachers to question, well, why do we do that? Why don't we just teach them object-oriented from the very beginning? And it turns out that there are some advantages and disadvantages with going with object-oriented from the beginning. And if you do go with object-oriented from the beginning, that curriculum change or modification to the curriculum is called objects early because I teach you about objects early. Okay, sir. Uh, I teach you about, oh, I need you uh, to go on the... The, the white machine and, and type the, the grades in. It's already logged into okay. the grade book. Sorry. Uh, I, I, so I, I'm going to be teaching you this curriculum here, which is objects early. The, the big advantage is that you don't have to learn the procedural and unlearn it. You can go right to here. It tends to be intellectually slightly more challenging than learning procedural first and then learning objects early. Now, what does this mean practically for you and your exams? You'll notice that we've already started talking about the dog class, and we're going to finish the dog class today or perhaps the next time we see each other. And then after that, we're going to do several other labs on objects. We're going to do the crab lab. We're going to do the aquarium lab. We're going to do the wombat lab. These are all object-oriented labs. Now, what's confusing here is when you take your first exam, which is on Unit 1, this stuff on objects is not on the test because the test sequence from the College Board doesn't have this objects early idea in mind. It has the more procedural stuff in mind. So there tends to be a little bit of confusion about why is Mr. Sarkar teaching this material when the test on it is still further down the road. And the reason is I want you to view the world as objects, so I'm teaching it to you early, but when it comes to the test, I will go out of my way to explain to you what topics are covered on the Unit 1 test and what topics are not covered. But we will be having quizzes on this as we go to make sure you're understanding the objects early. Does anybody have any questions about this? It'll make more sense as things start to unfold in my classroom. But for now, here's what you need to know. We're going to be pursuing this objects early curriculum, and we're going to learn about classes and objects pretty early in the course. That's mostly for Unit 9 in the official text, but we're actually going to be learning it at the beginning of the year. So when we get to Unit 9, it will be much shorter for us.